Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name's Robin Smith, and I am part of the technical sales team here at Autodesk. Um, this particular session uh, is a power-shaped session, um, and it's titled Core and Cavity Separation Techniques. So over the years, I've had all sorts of um, parts presented to me that I've needed to split, uh, and I've used many different techniques to achieve the desired results. And so what I'd like to try and do is share with you uh, some of the maybe uh, less obvious um, uh, techniques that, I, that I've used in the past. So a quick look at an agenda. Uh, we're going to be looking at splitting solids using, uh, uh, or sorry, splitting parts using the solids techniques. Uh, looking to uh, to split using the visible and invisible method. We'll be looking to uh, split solids using uh, continuous uh, convex and concave regions. The uh, die wizard, which has been with us for for some time now, but some of the finer points of that. And of course, uh, the uh, the more recent interactive uh, wizard, uh, and also just some insights in when and where to use those different techniques. Okay, so let's uh, let's make a start and uh, take a look at a power shape. So here's my uh, my first example, uh, some sort of a radiator cover uh, for a, for a car, and uh, this part's interesting because, yeah, it's a solid. Uh, oh no, sorry, it's it's um it's uh, surfaces, uh, and what I'd like to do is split this into uh, the inner and the outer regions, but. With this type of parts where you've got um, uh, kind of enclosed regions, what you see is that the, the inside region curves around and so on, uh, especially things like engine manifolds and so on, where you've got really quite uh, intricate interiors, especially for things like castings and so on. So a technique I've used here in the past is, uh, is to select faces that represent the edges where the inner and the outer meet. So here's an example of that on the end of this cylinder here. And then I would do that in all of the areas where that occurs. So there's another one there. And if I take a look at the bottom of this part, we can see that there's another region just there. So on this part, it looks like it's just those three faces. So using the middle mouse key, I'm going to assign those to a different layer and switch that layer off for a moment. So as I said, we can see that these are all surface entities. And what I'm going to do now is select all of those surfaces and simply turn them into a solid. And what happens is power shape wanders over the solid or the surfaces looking to connect all the faces and realizes it cannot connect all of the faces because certain areas are missing. So the natural step that it takes after that is to break them into separate solids. So if we take a look at what we've got here, I've got a solid that represents the outside but when I hide that, I'll use the control J key to hide this. You can see that I now have the interior region of this solid uh, removed away. So very quickly, I've split that. Now, this is a, a relatively simple example, uh, but it would work just as well on all sorts of complex uh, uh, interior shapes that you've got. You just simply uh, hide the end connecting faces. Good, so that's uh, a first method for splitting the part using solids. So let's take a look at uh, another example um, using solids. So in this case, again, it's, it's surface data, but it's far from perfect. You know, we, we don't always receive perfect data. More and more these days we do, but occasionally people send information that still needs to be split that is far from perfect and this is an example here of, of where that's the case you know there are a few holes in here and overlapping areas and so on but I still need to split this out into the areas that I want to work with so just as before I could use the solids to first of all select these regions and then ask to create a solid from those selected surfaces So once uh, again, PowerShake goes off and endeavors to uh, connect all of the regions and warns me here, there's a few really small surfaces that I'm not interested in, so it's, it's ignored those. Um, but what it's effectively done here is break these regions out into different solids. If I hide the outer one there, we can see the inner pipes now for these different regions have been um, 
So let's have a look at maybe just this one here on its own. So we, you can see that one there, and then likewise down here. Now, here's an interesting point that I'll just mention, and for, for those of you that have been using PowerShell for some time, you'll be aware of this, but for newer users, you won't. Um, these days, we use the uh, the Parasolid kernel as the, uh, the solid engine um, for our, our, our solid uh, tools. And the Parasolid kernel tries to connect everything to a really high degree of tolerance and so on. And this really wasn't the case in, uh, in this specific example. So we can see here we've got some open areas where uh, the Parasolid kernel is not sure what to do with the, the kind of data that I'm throwing at it, which was far from perfect. So if I were to undo that command, what I can always do is go back to, and I'll do this via the Tools Options page, and go to the Object page and look at Solids. I can always go back to version 8 solids, which were the native power shape solids, which were much more sympathetic to imperfect solid uh, data or surface data. So I switch that on now and box that same region and ask to create a solid from this. It warns me that I've got six separate solids, but you can see that the quality here, it hasn't uh, deviated these regions here. It's much more sympathetic to these overlapping areas and still gives me the result I want without necessarily uh, changing the trim conditions to something that I didn't want. So that, from the point of view of splitting the part into its constituent regions, has done a very nice job for me. In the future, incidentally, if you ever did want to get a, a local region from a, a, version eight, a version 8 solid to a uh, uh, one of the more modern uh, parasolid formats, you simply select it and you see the number eight button here on the, the solid toolbar. It's currently depressed. If I switch that off, that will be converted now into a parasolid. Okay, so that's a useful little tip when it comes to working with solids to, uh, to split the parts. And even when the data is far from uh, perfect, the tools uh, still uh, give us uh, some great results. So I'm gonna quickly turn that back on. So we're using the parasolid kernel and carry on. Okay, so uh, a piece of functionality that's been with us for a long time is the visible and invisible method. And uh, I'll, I'll mention this uh, because again, people may not be aware of it, uh, certainly the newer users. So here's a fairly simple part. It's a headlamp cavity or a headlamp component that I want to split into core and cavity. Uh, I've got a, uh, a Z axis pointing up, which is my active work plane. If you don't have an active work plane, it will use the global transform and it will use whatever of the buttons that we see at the bottom of the screen here, these here, to, uh, to decide which way we're going to try and split. Okay, so I've got a, uh, a work plane, I've got the Z axis pointing upwards and I'm going to split this part. Again, this is not solid data this is purely surface data that i'm using here i don't need to to, to uh, have solids for this one and all i simply do is select it all i'm going to use the control a to select everything there's a little tip control a will select everything on the screen and then i'm going to go to the wizards page and i'm going to go for the select visible and invisible regions so the latter one here is uh select only the visible regions this one here sorry, invisible here, visible here. So let's select that one. And immediately what's happened is only visible things from above, so from this direction, have been selected. So if I was to look at control K, just those things on their own, what we see is it selected just those regions. Can you see, however, that there is a limitation to this command, and that is that if there are any perfectly vertical surfaces, it doesn't know which layer they're on, so it just doesn't select them. Uh, it's not a big deal to go and re-choose those areas and add those in um, afterwards if we need to, but you just need to be aware of that, um, that functionality. Again, a little trick I've used in the past, if, I've, if the part uh, permits, is to take my work plane. And again, another little tip for you, if I use the Shift and the Alt key together, the graphic rotations on the screen change. Now imagine that you have a work plane that's in the corner of your, uh, your monitor. X would be along the bottom of the monitor, Y would be up the side of the monitor, and Z would be pointing straight out towards you. Now map those onto the mouse, and you've got X as the first uh, uh, key. Y would be, if you have a wheel mouse, it would be the wheel, and Z would be the right-hand mouse key. So I'm going to hold the Shift and the Alt key down, and I'm going to use the 
X, which is the first I, uh, mouse key, to rotate. You see, it, only, it will only rotate around that axis. It will not take me away from the, uh, the X rotation plane. So that can be really handy when trying to get a work plane that you really want. So I could maybe have a, a, a work plane that looks something like this, and then maybe looking along the Y. So now I'm using the, the, the wheel mouse to get a view something like this. And then temporarily, I could double click that work plane and simply align it to my current view. Because now when I come to split the part using the visible and invisible options, it finds the areas that I'm interested in in this area here. And of course, I could do that from a few different directions to get all of the, uh, the entities that I want. Okay, so that's the visible and invisible uh, option that's available as a sort of a quick split method just here. Right, let's move on from that one then. Take a look at a, another technique that's uh, very useful. Again, this one's to do with solids. And I've got a few solids on the screen here, and I'd like to take the upper ridge of the, uh, the casing and, and split this into core and cavity. And I want to do that quickly. So it's a solid. I can simply select it. And then using the, uh, the multiple region selection techniques here, I can quickly select the key areas. So one of the first options I'll mention is the select faces of continuous regions. So if I click that and then simply click on this top face, PowerShape will wash over that face looking for continuous regions and select only those areas for me. And once I've got those selected, I can very quickly either extract those out completely or copy them out as separate regions. And now what I have, if I hide the original solid, is just the surfaces representing that region that I can then go on to turn into a solid in itself, close off regions, create shutout faces, and so on. Okay, so let's undo that command. Go back to all of our solids and look at the underside here. Because with this one, maybe I want to select the interior region. So again, as I did before, I could select the solid. It doesn't have to be active. Ask for continuous regions, and then simply click in a region here. Now, it didn't get all of these areas. So I can go and start to add in by selecting either uh, convex or concave regions. And by simply clicking those regions, can you see there that it's added those in? And of course, if I have a single face that I want to add on, I can pop it into that mode as well. I'm holding the shift key down as I do this. So once again, very quickly, I've captured the regions that represent the area that I want to, uh, to extract. Once I've got that, I can simply either extract it out or copy it out. This time I'll extract it out. And what happens is that region is removed completely from the solid so that we have now just the, uh, the core region and just the cavity region to work with. Okay, so that's another technique that we can uh, we can think about uh, having in our arsenal when it comes to splitting parts. So let's move on from there and take a look at the die wizard. So the die wizard has been with us for uh, some time now, and there's an awful lot that it will do. Uh, I'd like to just go through some of that functionality to make everybody aware of it. So first and foremost, I've got a, I'm going to call it a clip cover. Uh, and I need to split that into the constituent parts, the core and the cavity in this case. I can select the solid first of all, go to the wizard page, which is already active, and then wander down until we find the start mold and die wizard option. As soon as I do that, you can see I've got my Z axis selected down here. As soon as I do that, the wizard launches and walks me through the process of splitting the part. So this is a very automatic process um, that, um, that we're going to go through. So the first thing I can see is that I have a bunch of crosses for various different um, types of entity apart from the product, which has a tick. And that's because I pre-selected the product before I started the wizard. If I hadn't pre-selected it, I'm going to just click in space. You can see that we get uh, a cross next to product. If I subsequently select it, what I get is, yeah, we have some sort of entity selected, but the wizard is not sure what it is yet. So if I was to hit the button at the bottom left-hand corner here, the wizard will fathom out from what I've got selected what each of the entities is. So now we can see we have the product selected. As I step through hitting the next button to the next page, what we get now 
uh, is a series of tools to help us define the regions that represent uh, the shutout areas, so the split around the edge and also any holes in the part that need closing off. The actual shutout face itself will go yellow and uh, enclosed regions that need closing off will be, will be green and they'll all have a number next to them. So what I can do at this stage, if I don't uh, like the automatic creation that has been uh, uh, created for me by PowerShape, is start to modify these and change them. Uh, let's take a look at how you do that because there's a lot of functionality on here. So first and foremost, let's take a look at region number one. What I can do is go to the combo box here and go and select region number one and immediately it highlights and detects that actually region number one is a, is a cylinder and I've got the choice of either the inner region or the outer region for this cylinder. So let's click the, uh, the option here to flip to the outer region. And you can see that it's automatically detected the outside of that cylinder as the option for the shutout region. Okay, well, that's good. Now let's go and take a look at region number five, which is a bit more complicated. And I'll go and select that from our pull down. And it highlights it to say that that's the active one. And then I can decide what I want to do with that. I can modify it or I can uh, delete it completely, which is what I'm going to choose to do here. I'm going to delete region number five. And now I'm going to create my own split region by using the composite curve tool to simply walk around the region where I would like to split. And let's say it's the, the edge of that fillet, fillet for argument's sake, and I can walk left and right using the composite curve tool. Or if it's fairly obvious, such as this one, I can hit the fast forward button and you can see that PowerShape has whizzed around that for me to close it off completely. Excellent, so once that's done, I'll record that region and finish the command. So we now have that region uh, selected and we have it modified to, to how we'd actually like to split the part. Once I'm done with this page, I can hit next. And now we're on to the uh, fill-in region. How do we go about closing off these regions that we've defined, these inner regions? And you can see there's kind of a left-hand side, which is tangent, and a right-hand side, which is non-tangent. Well, if I hit preview for now, just to see what we would get, you can see that PowerShape has automatically added in surfaces to these key regions. And although it's had a go at filling in the region that I specified, it's definitely not the result that I was looking for um, on this occasion. So I'm going to take region number one, and I'm going to nudge that over. And in fact, I'll do all of them. Why not? Nudge them over to the non-tangent side and preview that. And that's improved things. But if I was being pedantic, I would still say that's not quite what I had in mind. There's still a bit of a lump in there that I didn't really want. So rather than hit the next button to carry on to the next stage of this uh, wizard, at any stage during the wizard, I can hit the finish button. And as soon as I do that, can you see the uh, information dialog that's popped up there? That's PowerShape telling me that at any stage I can restart the wizard by simply selecting the objects that the wizard uh, uh, gave me as I finished. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to take a look at this surface here. That's not what I wanted. So I'm going to delete that completely. And then I'm going to go and select the curve that's been left behind by the wizard. And I'm going to create a surface of my own choosing for that region. And I'm going to use the smart surface to drop a surface in there. And you can see I get the same surface that the wizard created. It's not quite what I want here. So I'm going to hit the advanced button for that um, fill in surface. And on that advanced button, I've got the option to create a single patch. Now, this is a slightly different algorithm that really goes for a very smooth option uh, for these type of situations. So it's dropping a NURB, a non uniform rational B spline surface in here, but it's doing it uh, using a, a slightly different algorithm that uh, provides a very smooth result indeed. And you can see that there. So when I apply that, and click OK, we have now the surface for that region that we wanted. Excellent. So I'll reselect everything. And I'm going to relaunch the, uh, the wizard. And immediately we get three ticks now because the wizard's picked up on the fact that we not only have the product, but we have some split lines, some wireframe. Incidentally, I could have created these manually myself and then launched the wizard 
rather than use the one that's presented to me and it would have detected those and it's also uh, got here the shutouts that I've just um, uh, created myself a combination of created myself and used from the wizard so I'll click next this time I'll click next to these I'm happy with this stage yeah I've got all of those regions in here so I'll click next to that and now we're able to start to define whether there's any shrinkage required on this part and if so is it to a specific material in which case it's in the library for the shrinkage for those or would we like to provide the shrinkage in either one two or three axes ourselves I'm happy to leave it as it is for the demonstration so I'll click next so now we're looking at the uh, the block sizes for the uh, the inserts and there are two fields here I can uh, uh, manipulate the first is the the minimum uh, land dimension and if I click that one you can see that the values here change to represent what the minimum region is of land between the product and the edge of the die block likewise here if I want to flip that back to the overall size I can do exactly that and now I can work in overall sizes I can also work in relative values so relative from the edges of the block to the uh, to the part and so on and if you're not sure what these values represent just click the label and it will label them for you so that you can look to uh, to change knowing exactly what you're changing once you're happy with all of that I'll use the defaults here click next and now we're into the shutout uh, stage and you can see that PowerShape has endeavored to create a sensible shutout for us based on the path. And yeah, it's not bad, I, I could uh, go with that, but I have lots of tools here to change it if I, if I desire to, uh, to. So maybe the first thing I wanna do is add some, maybe some taper on this draft. Maybe it's not absolutely square to the part. Maybe it needs to be uh, tapered in some way. And I can do that using one of the options here. I could go to the page here and ask to create an angled split face. And as soon as I click that, I have the choice as to how it's angled. Is it angled uh, square to the, the surface normal of the part, or is it angled to the Z plane? And there's not a great deal of difference in this example, uh, but that's what this button would do. It's whether it's relative to the part or relative to the Z coordinate. I'm going to enter 10 degrees here, click OK, and then use the binoculars here to preview what the uh, result of that would look like. And you can see I've added taper on. But let's say that's not what I wanted. So again, I'm going to click back into this page, knock that back to zero, click OK, preview again, we're back to where we started. Because what I'd like to do is go in and, and really start to fine tune this myself. And I'll do that using this button here, which is the advanced split servicing options. So there's kind of two modes to this form. There's the insert, the creation mode, and the edit mode. We're currently in the creation mode because we're having we have the insert break breakpoints switched on if I was to switch that off for a moment you can see there are effectively four different segments right now and I'm able to go and choose from here which segment I'm working on so let's go and look at segment number two and you can see the arrow has flipped to this region and we can just see here there's a little marker on this end here and a little mark here that represents where these corners are now that's all very convenient if those markers happen to be where I want them to be, but, but maybe they're not. So in that situation, what I can do is I can switch on the insert breakpoints page and then use the clear button to completely remove all of the areas that are currently in there. Now I have the choice to add my own in by simply clicking key locations. And there's a button here that allows me to choose, am I going to use it as a, a gentle transition? So maybe on the two different sides of this point, two different things are happening. How does it transition from one side to the other? Does it do that smoothly or is it distinctly different from one side to the other? Well, I'm gonna treat it as very much a hard corner where it's different from one side to the other. Then I'm gonna go in and click where I want the corner to be. And you can just make out, it's put a little dot on there to say that that's a, a corner point now. I'll do exactly the same over here. I'll whiz in, choose this as a corner point, and then around, the front of the part, I'm going to choose somewhere about mid-range on the, uh, the fillet here to choose as one point, and then mid-range on this one here to choose as another point. Beautiful. So I'm going to switch off insert mode, and now we're back into edit mode. So what is it I'd like to do? Well, I've got region number two selected. I can choose whether it's going inwards or outwards by clicking the arrow. So the default was correct there. And then I'm going to change the split direction to either be radial so regularly following the, uh, the perpendicular uh, edge of the curve or along a specific axis. And then PowerShape will take an informed decision about which axis it needs to be 
based on the region I've selected. And you can see it's got Y selected here, which is the correct result. So that's great, but in that region, I'd actually like to have some taper. So negative 10 degrees I'm going to put in. And if I hit the preview button, it will give me some little kind of wireframe lines to give me a clue as to, to what, uh, what I'm going to get. So that all looks pretty good there. Region four, similar story. Uh, knock that over to uh, a long axis. This time it's uh, taken an informed guess at um, Y pointing outwards, which is great. And I'd like, again, negative 10 for that region. For region one, at the, uh, the top end here, I'm going to just flip that to be aligned to axis. And again, leave it. It's taken a, a decision as X, which looks good to me. And finally, for region four, sorry, region uh, three, this region here, I'm going to flip that to be rather than aligned to axis, I'm going to use a, a radial motion. And so what it will do now is kind of fan around the corners and generally deal with any collapsing points that happen uh, as it does so. Beautiful. So that all looks pretty good, that preview. I'm going to click OK to that. And now I'm going to use the, oh, in fact, automatically it's updated to show me the fruits of my, uh, my labor there. And you can see I've got a very distinct sort of tailored shutout that has this tapered condition here with a radial effect going around the outside edge. But let's say the shutout was for rather than a plastic injection mold, maybe it was for a, a casting or a, or a forging or something like that. I may need some sort of a bead surface um, running around the edge for excess material to flow into. Sorry, I meant a pressing or a forging. So uh, if we were to look at the, uh, the button here, create a step surface. I can click this and then a new form pops up with all sorts of options on it to control what the step or the bead looks like around the edge. I'm going to use the default here. You can clearly see what each of these does. The radius here, radius here, angle, and then the, the length uh, at the start and the end of the, uh, the part. If I just hit the preview for a default view, you can see that what we've done here is we've created uh, a bead surface around the edge that we can, of course, control to our specific requirements. I don't need that on this occasion. I just wanted to make you aware of the functionality. I'm going to click cancel to that. And then I'm going to move on to uh, the next stage. So having done all of the, uh, the options here and I'm happy with them, I can click next. And now we're into the, uh, the Z values of the, uh, the die blocks. And again, as before, I've got control over the absolute values uh, or the relative values. And if you're happy with those, let's say that I am with the defaults, uh, I can click next. Finally, I'm given the option as to what to do in the corners on these die blocks. Do I want radii? Do I want that the same on all corners or do I want to apply different things to different corners? And I'll do that just to show you. I'll go with a chamfer on the, uh, the, uh, the second corner here. I'll go with a no condition on the, uh, the lower corner and then a radius on the uh, top corner. Of course, I can control the, the values as well. When I hit next to that, you can see that those values are, regions are added. And finally, I can use the wizard here to just graphically show that the part has been split into the key regions for me. And that's done as two separate solids. So I have the original solid unaltered, as well as the uh, cavity and core uh, inserts created. OK, so that is the die wizard. So let's take a look uh, at the remaining example here, which is the interactive method. Now, this is a great uh, tool. When things get more complicated, the, the wizard is very good. And I, just to sort of demonstrate that, I'll start it here just quickly to show you that it will make sense of, so long as you've got a, a valid solid that's in good condition, uh, i.e. no faults, etc. Uh, the wizard will do a good job of detecting all the regions for you, all the holes, uh, the shutout and so on, and go on to create the various regions from that. So just as before, you can see I could then go in and start to modify that. But what I find uh, when I'm working on more complicated parts is I don't always know what I need before I start. I, I, I kind of sort of change and adjust things as I go along and, and make decisions based on what I'm seeing as, as I sort of unwrap what's going on. So this is the, uh, the kind of the interactive wizard that I find so useful for that kind of work. And it appears again on the wizard toolbar, and it's the last icon here, separate into core and cavity. And I simply click the button, 
And what happens is I'm presented with two colors, green for the top and red for the bottom, and then a very distinctive uh, form here that has this slider bar that allows me to literally drag the two away from each other. Now, what the wizard has done is anything that is obviously from above, it's put on the green layer, if you like, and everything that's obviously from below, it's put on the red layer. And then when I slide this, it splits the two away from each other. Anything that it's not sure about, it leaves exactly where it is. But the great thing is, as I start to select these entities, can you see what happened there? I selected the region here, and then it highlighted on the part where that would connect in both regions. So that gives me a clue as to, to where it's going to go. And I can do nice things like slide it back into position and, and figure out, okay, right, where's that gonna go then? Yeah, I think I'm gonna put that on the, the lower. So let's do exactly that. I'm gonna box maybe all of these actually for speed. I'll just box all of these. So I've just selected them. And as I wander back over the lower region, can you see that the icon changes to a plus, a hand with a little sort of, I'll call it a plus uh, here. And I'll click it there with the left mouse key and immediately it's assigned those entities to that layer. Likewise, these look pretty uh, straightforward. I'll select these, you can see it's highlighting where they would go. I'll just click somewhere on that, um, that region to add them to that, um, that layer. Beautiful, so let's start to look in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna sort of put it back together again and look what's going on in, in this area here. Okay, so as I start to separate that, yeah, okay, I can see that that region there probably needs to be on the uh, the opposite side. So let's drag it apart a little bit and select that region there. And looking like it's the same on the other side, so we'll grab those. And I'll flip those from the, the, the side that they're on by simply clicking the green side to this side. And you can see that very quickly assign them to the other the other side of the uh, the uh, the alternatives. Okay, uh, all good. But again, if I just slide it back and take a look in this region, you can see the proposed shutout that I'm being given here, that, that wireframe edge. Uh, it's kind of a knife edge gonna get created there. So I'd like to maybe do something about that. Uh, so what I can do, is by clicking the button in the top right hand corner here, do you see this one here, uh, split faces? I can click that and we go into a kind of a mode now, a solid editing mode. And you can see the solid toolbars popped up and I've also got a little uh, box here with a tick and a cross in it. So either keep what I do or abandon it if I don't like it. And what I'd like to do is first of all, create a line that's a non-continuous line that goes from a key position, let's say that corner there up to this corner here. And once I've done that, I'm going to select this face on the solid, you can see it goes orange, and I'm going to use that to split the face or divide the face, finding the nearest solution on the face using this wireframe. I get the two ticks to say I've got everything I need. When I apply that, you can see that the face has been uh, broken according to the nearest solution uh, for the line that I created. So that's great, I'll cancel that for a moment select the line and delete it. So now let's go and do the other side. And a similar story, I'll create a line that's non-continuous from that corner there up to this corner here. And then I'll simply select the face I'd like to divide, this one here, as to divide the face for the nearest point using this wireframe, apply. I've got the two ticks, apply. I'll go back and select, I don't need to reselect the wireframe, but there is another face I'd like to divide, that one there. So I'm gonna select a face again, and I'm gonna select this new face here and apply again. So now I'll cancel that and delete this line. And then having done all of that, I'm simply gonna click the tick to say I've finished my edits. And can you see what's happened there? Now what's happened is the shutout is updated to show me the new condition and now I've got the ability to go and choose these new faces and just assign those to the layer that I want them to be on. So just here, yeah, these here, that one there is going to sit on this layer and the one that's on this layer, that one there is gonna just pop back up onto this, this layer here. So what we've done there is we've used the split tool to first of all, break them into the regions we want, assign different things to different layers and then make some edits 
to decide exactly how we want the shutout to flow in the different regions. So let's have a look at the back of this part, because what I can see here are some regions that haven't been touched. And to me, if I was molding this, it looks like these are going to be some sort of sliding action, some sliding call that would come in from the side. So what would be good is if I could select those and declare that region as a sliding core. I don't know if you noticed there, but when I selected that region, just watch what happens here, this add draw direction. It becomes available to me. And if I click it, PowerShape looks at the surrounding region and decides, well, this is the most likely draw direction based on what I have selected. But of course, with everything in PowerShape, you can always make uh, interactive changes yourself. So if you just suddenly decide, actually, no, I need it to be according to a particular work plane, you can select the work plane mode, click the work plane, and the draw direction will change to be whatever uh, the Z or the whatever you have selected down here is of the, of the work plane. I, of course, wanted the surface, so I'm going to click that back and then go and select the surface that represents the direction. And, of course, you can test that using the, uh, oops, sorry, click the tick to say I'm finished. You can test that using the slide here to make sure that you're happy with the motion that you're getting. Final thing I'm going to mention is that you can create the wireframe for the split condition you've created automatically. So I'll say create wireframe from split line. And if you'd like to try and retain the colors that are being used here, you can also look to switch that on or off. All I'll do now is click the finish button. And the part is broken into those constituent regions for me. So if I was to look at just that region there, we can see both the core and the cavity in position for that part. We have the wireframe around the edge, and there's nothing to stop us now using, for example, the surfacing tools to create a split surface that runs around the edge of this part. Let's make it, I don't know, 100 millimeters, just so you can see it. Uh, align to axes, preview how that looks. And we can see we have our shutout that I can extend as far as I want and then cut it away from a solid block in the future. Okay, so um, that's kind of leading me towards the uh, the end of the session. I'm just going to recap on uh, on what we've seen here. So we use the uh, the solids method, both uh, version eight and um, uh, the parasolid versions, to select. Uh, edge regions, hide those, and then automatically split the solid um, into the inner and the outer regions. And again, that's a great technique for enclosed parts within a walls. We use the uh, long-standing invisible uh, and visible method, uh, and that's great if you just want to get a quick split on surfaces without going to uh, to the, the solid stage. You can just quickly select whatever's on the screen uh, and look to. Uh, to change the selection to either the visible or invisible regions. We looked at using the solid, continuous, convex, and concave regions to, uh, to split the, the model. So we turned it into a solid, then used those uh, global selection tools to, to quickly capture the areas and extract those out or copy those out uh, to give us what we needed. And then, of course, we looked at the uh, the die wizard, which has been there for a long time, and this is great for good condition um, solids that don't have faults, where we want a really uh, into, uh, automatic uh, pro process to take us through the entire process of splitting those parts. And of course, we finished on the interactive wizard, which is good for uh, all solids where we're not sure what we want as we go, and we can sort of make decisions as we start to split it and interactively work with it to get the desired uh, solution that we wanted. Okay, so uh, any questions that did arise, I'm not sure if there were or weren't during this session. Just to let you know, those session, uh, those questions were being monitored, uh, and what we'll do is we'll provide answers to those um, so that everybody uh, can get visibility to those um, after the session. This session will also be um, uh, has been recorded and will also be hosted uh, an email to everybody that registered for this session. Uh, even if they uh, they weren't uh, attending, they'll, they'll get the, the opportunity to see this session. So the final thing to mention is that uh, this is going to be kind of a regular occurrence. We're, we're looking to do these sessions. Um, so the next session is going to be on surface analysis tools or model analysis tools. Let me rephrase that. And that is going to be uh, on May the 3rd. Um, 
all that remains is to thank you all very much for taking the time this bright and sunny morning to uh, to watch this session and I look forward to uh, talking to you all again soon. Thank you very much.